I'm up here today based on a principle. I'm, based, uh, I'm here based on the principle that all of us have a right as American citizens to have the expectation that our answers will go answered and that we will have accountability uh, for 9-11. 9-11 uh, was, a, was a tragic event. Uh, it, it especially resonated with people in New York City for obvious reasons. And uh, it's one of the reasons why the birthplace of 9-11 Truth Movement, among other places in the country, it was one of the birthplaces of 9-11 Truth because it, it, it makes sense. Uh, we were there on that day and it made sense that you know, people were very badly traumatized and in the weeks that followed and the months that followed and in the years that followed, people congregated and uh, we're meeting in church basements and in uh, town halls in the hopes of being able to share their experiences, but also to be able to ask questions. Okay, the questions that we asked in those early days of 9-11 Truth are the same questions that are, are still unanswered today. And that's a little bit disturbing. Um, louder. Um, I started in this movement, uh, you know, it wasn't my intention to join a movement. Um, you know, in the morning of 2001, uh, September 11, 2001, I was at work on the 43rd floor of a high-rise building on Central Park South, and um, early in the morning at around a quarter to nine, we heard a very loud noise. It sounded like a, pl a plane was approaching, uh, like it was coming in for a landing. And people were very startled. I remember someone in, in the office adjacent to my running into the hall and saying, you know, wow, you know, what, what is that? And uh, it was a very modern building, very glass walls that you could uh, see a very panoramic view of Manhattan. And, uh, you know, sure enough, a plane passed very close, although it probably seemed closer than it really was. Uh, a plane passed very close and all eyes were on it. We watched this plane as it moved from, uh, as it moved south over Manhattan. And people were speculating, well, that plane is in trouble. Um, first of all, it was flying way too low. Uh, anybody who knows Manhattan, you may see planes up in the sky, but they're, they're way up there. They don't let planes fly that low over, over the skyline in Manhattan. You certainly never hear them. Uh, this plane was very low over the skyline. At one point, we thought it was going to hit the building of Rockefeller Center, uh, 40 Rock, because it's the tallest building in that area. Uh, but that was, that was a trick of uh, perspective and dimension. It, it didn't come close to that building. But we were watching this plane and it seemed to be in trouble. It was uh, rocking from side to side. It didn't seem very steady in the air. So we all watched this plane and uh, you know, I, I remember thinking at some point he's going to veer off to the left, he's going to go to Kennedy Airport and he's, he's going to try to make a landing there because that was the only airport I could think of on his trajectory. And I was also thinking why is he staying over the most populated uh, area of the city? Why doesn't he you know, stay over the river if he is in trouble? Well, a few seconds later, of course, he did slam into the World Trade Center. Uh, there was a very hushed reaction in my office. You know, a lot of low voices going, oh my, oh my God, oh my God. Uh, very large fireball. It was, it was very surrealistic. I, I don't think any of us knew how to exactly absorb what we had just seen. Uh, and then, of course, 15 minutes later, we saw it happen a second time, and we knew what was happening. Uh, many of the people in the office flew into a panic because, well, okay, this is obviously happening intentionally. People are flying planes into buildings and we're in one of the tallest buildings in Manhattan. So some of the people panicked and started running towards the exits to get out of the building. Um, I stayed, I immediately started trying to call my wife who was in, um, he was, she was downtown Manhattan, although not in the area of, of the disaster, but she was certainly much closer than I was. Um, the rest of that day was, was uh, was a traumatic experience for my wife and I. We had to get out of Manhattan. We basically saw the buildings collapse. Um, we were perhaps not as traumatized as the people who were in lower Manhattan that day, but we certainly had a, a rough experience in, as, in terms of uh, compared to people who watched it on TV. Uh, we smelled the smoke, we could see the flames, we could see the, the smoke rising, and we certainly knew that we had just lost uh, potentially thousands of our neighbors in New York City who worked down there. Uh, we certainly knew the firemen must have been on the scene, and when those buildings went down, uh, people were crying in the streets. It was, it was a very traumatic experience. It was one of the reasons why I was drawn to these uh, impromptu grassroots sorts of organizations that started springing up all over Manhattan in church basements and in whatever gathering places we could find because people needed, uh, people needed group therapy, I guess is the way you could put it, uh, but people had questions. Uh, 
we were being told the air was safe to breathe in Manhattan. You know, at, I, there's never been accountability for that. I mean, you know, it's been revealed that memos from the White House went to uh, the Environmental Protection Agency directing them to tell people that the air was safe to breathe. People returned to their apartments and there was dust accumulated on their furniture and they were told by the EPA, use a damp cloth to clean off this, uh, this toxic waste. And let's keep in mind that this toxic waste included mercury, lead, asbestos. We still don't know the extent of the damage that was done as a result of, of that misinformation that we were given. What sort of biological time bombs exist in people's bodies that may not show up for 10, 20, 30 years and then manifest itself as cancer or leukemia, we, we don't know. Um, but it's one of those things that was one of the founding principles of 9-11 Truth, which is one of the reasons why I'm here. I started attending these meetings, and what I quickly found out was that there were a lot of questions that were growing. There was a body of research, very legitimate research, with very fundamental questions about what went wrong here. How, how could this happen? Uh, you would expect the populace to respond that way. You would expect, after seeing something as traumatic as 3,000 of your fellow citizens dying, that people would gather and start asking some very pointed questions. It even happened in China. I don't know if you remember a few years back, they had a, a, a very bad earthquake and people were in the streets demanding to know why the building codes had been lax and they hadn't been built to standards. And you know, this is, this is what people do, it's human nature. We expected that we would get answers and we very quickly aligned ourselves with the 9-11 Family Steering Committee to the 9-11 Commission in the hopes that some of these questions could be compiled, which they were, on the steering committee website, and we'd start getting some, some of the answers associated with these. Well, what we, what we found was that very quickly there was obstruction. There was, uh, there was stonewalling. There was every sort of uh, political tap dance that you can imagine to really just block the victim's family, stop any kind of investigation. And that's where 9-11 Truth started. And that's why I'm still here today. Uh, in 2006, I decided that I wanted to compile some of these unanswered questions and I wanted to put them into, a, into the form of, of a short film, a 90 minute film. And, and I did, and we showed it locally in some of these churches and I, I did manage to get it into the Tribeca Film Festival. It was shown at the uh, Tribeca Screening Room to uh, basically to an audience of our own, our own people. Um, but it very quickly took off. Uh, apparently some of these questions were not just limited to New York City and people who were witnesses, people all over the country, and in fact, people all over the world were asking these very same questions. No conspiracy theories, no one was, was uh, uh, providing any exotic theories as to who was responsible or how these things may, may have occurred, but we were interested in why they occurred and how they occurred, and we were interested in why no one seemed interested in these questions. Why no one in the mainstream media seemed interested in asking the most fundamental questions. I mean, if not this story, what story? What, you know, what, what, what would interest a journalist? Because I would think if you're a journalist, this would be the equivalent of crack, okay? Uh, so, you know, the, story, the, the movie very quickly took off. I was very surprised to see that it showed up in Europe and that it was being translated into multiple languages. 